done before, living away from home and managing meals on their own. For many, that creates a unique kind of stress with new research released this year by UC Davis showing that 45% of undergrads there experience food insecurity, slightly above the 44% confronting that challenge across the entire UC system. Not feeding yourself properly because of high food costs, just one of the stressors that can push young adults into disordered eating. Jennifer Lombardi, Behavioral Health Manager for Kaiser's Eating Disorder Services and Adult Intensive Outpatient Programs with me now to discuss what parents need to watch out for in their college age kids and how students can really do better for themselves as well. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Definitely. Now, almost 29 million Americans will have an eating disorder sometime during their lifetime, and the anxiety of that is kind of baked into the whole brand new college experience. We're talking about making new friends, self-doubt, the expense of shopping for food can all push someone over the edge, right? Yeah, so I think it's a time of year when there's so much excitement, right? So, you know, I have a college age student myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a parent Congrats. and I thank you. <laughs> and I know that it's there's a lot that's built into that, right? So of course it's natural for parents or caregivers to be very excited along with their loved ones. But if you have somebody who's struggling with an eating disorder, there's a lot that you need to take into consideration and have a plan so that if there's a suspicion that something's going on, that it's talked about and you work with treatment providers to have a plan for what needs to happen when they go away to school. So let's talk about some of those things to watch out for. If you're a parent and you're on a call with your kid and you say something like, oh, well, isn't the cafeteria opening soon? And I don't want to keep you from getting down to dinner. And then what you hear back is, oh, I'm not feeling hungry. That's one of those potential signs. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes we shy away from having these really honest and heartfelt conversations. And so my first encouragement to parents are if you suspect something, don't stay quiet about it. Okay. Be willing to ask the question directly, you know, I have and be very clear about what your concerns are. I'm concerned that you're not eating to the amount that you need to support your body and, and all the activities that you're doing. The other question that sometimes I think gets missed is how much are you spending time at the gym and how mm. much are you exercising? Because that's something that oftentimes gets overlooked because we're putting so much pressure in our culture to diet and exercise. And so exercise is seen as a quote unquote healthy thing. But for so many college students, it becomes too much of a good thing. And it's this weird time when you're trying to give kids more independence and not kind of nanny gram them every two minutes. And so if they're choosing to do this, or maybe you know they do have a, a fitness goal that could be healthy, and so they want to go for this 90 minute instead of a half an hour workout. Parents may not know when to step in there. It is a right. difficult time. Right. So I think having touch points regularly with your, your, mm -hmm. you know, your loved one when they're yeah. away at school, whether it's FaceTime, not just on the phone, planning to visit as often as you can. And then I always say, you know, if, if they went away to college and they weren't struggling with an eating disorder, but you have suspicions while they're there, again, take the steps that you need to take. Ask the questions. If you have connections with roommates that mm -hmm. you feel comfortable, ask, you know, what are some of the things they may be concerned about? Because oftentimes, you know, their roommates may not want to step in or be involved. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to understand, you know, eating disorders have the distinction of having the highest, second highest mortality rate of any mental health condition, second only to opioid use disorder. Wow. So in our culture, not talking about this really contributes to colluding with the illness, in a sense. NRA can be a valuable resource, too, because it's not Absolutely. a roommate. There's somebody who has been had some training by the university to sort of be watching out for the people in their housing unit. So that's something. Also, if you have a son, and maybe they haven't grown up slender, stereotypes of anorexia, for example, are that they only happen to women, and that it's only thin people that are dealing with this. So. You may not be thinking about that when it comes to your son, who may be, you know, a little less than slender, and so it may slow a family's response. Right. So I think in our culture, what's interesting in my career, I can speak firsthand that I've seen a dramatic increase in the number of boys and men who identify as struggling with an eating disorder so and then seeking treatment. So first and foremost, for males that may be listening or parents of males, they're not alone. Um, and we know, for example, with anorexia, the estimates are about 25% of people who struggle with anorexia are male or identify as male. So this is not you know, a female only illness, um, to be sure. Well, as students may themselves be realizing that something is wrong, it takes a lot to make that first step and go to the campus clinic or connect with an RA to start talking about this. So what should students do? How should parents be supporting? Because you may be miles and miles away 
I mean, you may just be one mile away, but that's too far if something's going wrong with your kids. So how do we start that? Because it's really a brave process to get started in terms of reaching out for help. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think what's really important for people to understand is that this, this is an illness that requires a team. And a therapist who specializes in eating disorder care and has specialized training is absolutely critical. In addition to that, ensuring that this person has a full medical evaluation. That's one of the things that times that often gets missed. And it, because oftentimes what's happening to the body, this person may be functioning, they may be going to class and doing well with their schoolwork, but what's going on on the inside, we won't know until we do a thorough medical assessment. So involving a primary care doctor either on campus or back at home and a dietitian as well who specializes in eating disorder care. And what's happening out in life may be making them feel very out of control, but they feel like they can control their food or their workout routine. Thank you so much for joining us today with all of these tips as everybody heads back to campus. It's a really delicate time to work out these issues and really drill down and pay attention. Artie, thank you so very thank much. You. We appreciate you.